Hello everyone, I am Dr. Singaram. Welcome to the discussion of INICT November 2022 questions in pediatrics. Before I start the session, uh, a quick review about the questions which were asked in this INICT. It was a standard uh, question pattern uh, comprising of around 10 to 12 questions in each of the INICT sessions. And talking about the topics from where the questions were asked, it was all based on uh, the recent exam topics. Some new topics were there, but most of the questions were from the recent exam topics, which underlines the fact that you should thoroughly go through the recent questions completely, not only the question, but the topics which were asked in that particular question. Okay, so let us get started with the questions which were asked in the first session. So session number one, this was the first question. Handedness is seen at the age of. This is a question related to developmental milestone. It is one of the repeat questions as well. The answer is straightforward one and it is three years of age. Okay, that is a time when handedness is usually seen. Now, some of the related questions are when is the child able to transfer the object? This is something which is important. Transferring of the object from one hand to another hand. It is not handedness. Handedness means predominantly using one hand over another. Transferring of object is just like randomly playing with one hand or the other. When is the transfer of objects obtained? It is by the age of six months. Another important question, I told you handedness is obtained at the age of three years of age. Suppose you see a child at the age of one year itself obtaining handedness. What is the meaning? It is not early handedness. It means that the child is having weakness in the other limb okay or early handedness is not a milestone it is something like a problem in the sense that there is a contralateral weakness so if there are early handedness in the right limb it means that the left limb is weak it may be a condition like even congenital hemiplegia also which is causing weakness of the other limb so that is what is the importance of early handedness now coming to the second question, alternate procedure for height measurement in a 5 year old child. Now this question was something like a picture based question where they put up a picture of stadiometer and height measurement and they asked an alternate procedure. So very simply alternative for height measurement in a 5 year old child. These were the options we had arm span, CRL which is crown rump length, uh, HC which is head circumference and knee height measurement. If you see the last option knee height measurement. It is something like where we make the child to sit and measure the sitting height, which is the knee height. Okay, it can be approximated to the height, but it is very, very inaccurate and definitely we cannot use this as an alternate for height measurement. That's out. Head circumference is nowhere related to the question and that option is automatically out. Crown rim length is more for a fetal measurement and not after birth measurement. Okay, so eliminating all these options, uh, the best answer is arm span. We all know that arm span is something which is measured by outstretching the hands and measuring the distance between the tips of the fingers. That is how arm span is measured. Arm span is almost an approximate or equivalent to height measurement. We know that arm span is equal to height at the age of 10 years, exactly equal to height around the age of 10 years. But the age before 10 years, it is like one to two centimeter less. And for ages after 10 years, it is 1 to 2 centimeter more. Whatever it is, it is an approximately equal to the height measurement. So that is why in this particular question, the best answer is arm span. Now moving on to the next question, which of the following condition increases the risk of recurrence of febrile seizure? This is a standard question. Previously, so many questions about febrile seizures have been asked. And this time they asked about what are the risk factors for recurrence? This is one of the text which is taken directly from Nelson's textbook of pediatrics, which enlists the major and minor risk factors. Okay, I'll straight away tell the answer and then I will go to the table from the Nelson textbook. Age less than one year is definitely an important risk factor. It's a major risk factor. Temperature of 38 to 39 degrees Celsius is also an important risk factor. Duration of fever less than 24 hours is also an important risk factor. In fact, most of the children with febrile seizure, they develop seizure within the first 24 hours of onset of fever. So these three are important risk factors. The last one, duration of fever more than 48 hours is not a risk factor. So choosing the option one, two and three are the major risk factors for recurrence of febrile seizure. So it fits with the option A as the answer for this particular question. This is what is the um, 
reference from Nelson textbook of pediatrics which enlist the major and minor risk factors for recurrence of febrile seizure. Major risk factors was, was asked in the question namely the age less than 1 year, duration of fever less than 24 hours and fever of 38 to 39 degrees centigrade. There are also some minor risk factors like this family history of seizures or epilepsy, complex febrile seizure, a child in the daycare, male gender and low serum sodium at the time of presentation. Now out of this minor risk factors, the first three are very very important ones. Okay, Family history of febrile seizures or epilepsy as well as complex, complex febrile seizure are important risk factors. So you should definitely know about them. Now one more extension of the question can be asked in future which could be what is the percentage risk that also can be asked. Suppose there is no risk factors, imagine there is no risk factors. Do you think there is no risk of recurrence? Not at all. Uh, febrile seizure is a condition which is actually characterized by recurrences. So even without any risk factors also, a child with a febrile seizure can have recurrence and how much is the probability? It is 12 percentage. Okay. Obviously when the risk factors are present, the probability will increase. When there is one risk factor, the uh, probability is 25 to 50 percent. If there are two risk factors, it is 50 to 90, 59 percent. And if there are three or more risk factors, it can even touch up to 100 percentage. So this is one extension of the previous question which can be asked in the future exam. So you should make a note of it. Moving on to the next question regarding HCMV. HCMV is nothing but human CMV. Which of the following is a true statement? This is one of the uh, repeated topics. Okay. Very recently a question about CMV came in the exams. This is one more uh, question about the same topic of CMV infection. This is about congenital CMV infection. As a group congenital infections or torch infection is very important for exam and CMV is something which is very repeatedly asked in that particular topic. So let us look at the option we should find out which is the true statement. CMV is the most common cause of non-syndromic sensorineural hearing loss in children. This is the true statement and an important and, and the answer for this particular question also. Remember we always say this. Um, generally sensorineural hearing loss has a syndromic or a genetic association but among the non-syndromic causes it is the torch infection or CMV which is the most common cause. This fact has been asked in a previous exam also. Then 30 to 40 percent are asymptomatic at the time of birth. It is a wrong statement because 90 percent of the babies are asymptomatic at the time of birth. Most of the CMV infections are asymptomatic that is a point to be noted. So it's a wrong statement. Third statement diagnosis by urine specimen after 4 weeks of age. See diagnosis is by urine specimen that is true but it is not after 4 weeks. It is in the first 4 weeks after birth itself you have to make the diagnosis. So it is not after 4 weeks it is within 4 weeks after birth. Okay. And coming to this diagnosis there has been previous year questions. Urine is the best specimen. Make a note of this it is not the blood it is a urine which is the best specimen and the test which we do is the viral culture or CMV culture that is supposed to be the best investigation for diagnosis of congenital CMV infection. Look at the last option. In developing countries major cause of congenital infection is primary CMV infection of the mother. Of course the baby gets the infection from the mother but in developing countries it is not primary CMV infection. It is reactivation of the CMV infection. Very important. Please remember in developing country like India, most of the adults already have an exposure to CMV in their childhood. So that means primary infection usually occurs in young childhood itself. It is more of reactivation rather than primary CMV infection. So, if, so mothers being adults, they get reactivation of CMV infection. So that is why this option is wrong. These are all the important points about congenital CMV infection. Many of these points have been asked in the previous exam. Few more points about congenital CMV infection. It is a condition which has got certain set of characteristic features. One of course is sensorineural hearing loss. Second, this is very very important periventricular calcification, one of the classical features of congenital CMV infection as well as microcephaly and chorioretinitis as well. But periventricular calcification something which is very uniquely associated with CMV infection. So you should make a note of it. Then what could be the treatment option for these children? Treatment option is nothing but Gancyclovir. Okay? The treatment is Gancyclovir which is a drug of choice. 
Remember the treatment of congenital CMV infection will not reverse the manifestation in the brain but the primary aim is to prevent the progression of chorioretinitis in these children. Okay? So, gamcyclovir is the treatment of choice for congenital CMV infection. It is very very important that you should go through the entire list of and the topic of torch infection because potentially questions are going to be asked in the future exams also. Okay. Moving on to the next question. The parents notice that the child is tired and notices he feels shortness of breath on climbing the stairs and also in the supine position. What is the first investigation you will do? See this is a very classical history. What is that? Child is tired, shortness of breath which is nothing but dyspnea on climbing stairs and in supine position. What is this telling? It is nothing but classical features of orthopnea. Okay. Okay. Orthopnea and one more is also this nocturnal dyspnea or two very very classical features of cardiac failure. We all know about this. So, if it is cardiac failure in this particular child, what should be the first investigation you will plan? Of course, it is echocardiography which is the last option Okay, to look for the functioning of the heart or to document cardiac failure. Remember this finding orthopnea which is given very clearly in the question. Now, in young children, okay, there can be something like equivalent of orthopnea. What the mother can tell you? The child is feeling the, the child is restless in the supine position and when I put the child to shoulder, okay, the uh, breathing difficulty or the restlessness becomes better. It is an equivalent of orthopnea in young children. One more point to be noted is in, in young children, classical feature of heart failure may be in the form of feeding difficulties. This is a typical description in infants where the mother tells you like this, the child when is um, at the time of breastfeeding becomes restless or diaphoretic at the time of uh, feeding. It is a feature of exertional dyspnea in young children and what they say, so the child is not feeding properly. So what happened? The child will take rest after within few minutes of feeding itself. The child will take rest then again will feel hunger and then again starts feeding. But the feeding will always be an interrupted feeding. This is what we classically remember as suck rest suck cycle. So, I wanted to emphasize the fact that feeding difficulty is a common feature of cardiac failure in young children especially in infants that is the point to be noted. Moving on to the next question, a child comes to you with acute exacerbation of asthma, which of the following would you do? This is like a multiple option question where you have to choose all the correct things in the management of acute exacerbation of asthma. Look at the first one. Chest x-ray is usually not at the time of acute exacerbation of asthma. See, chest x-ray is not useful in this situation because our primary goal in management of an acute exacerbation of asthma is to maintain proper oxygen status as well as to quickly reverse the bronchoconstriction. That is what is our aim. We don't waste time by taking x-ray. Maybe in a refractory cases, okay, where the child is not responding to the usual treatment, as a last step, you may do the chest x-ray, but it is not usually done in the management of acute exacerbation of asthma. So, this is wrong. Okay. Next one, oxygen definitely is indicated in the management of asthma. Next, salbutamol nebulization three times in 60 minutes. This is one of the standard treatment in acute exacerbation. What do we do? We will give salbutamol nebulization once every 20 minutes. That means three times in one hour or 60 minutes. This is a true statement. Oral steroids are also found to be useful in the acute exacerbation of asthma. So, it was a multiple uh, option type question where you have to choose an option which was having all the three management possibilities. Okay, Except chest x-ray, everything is useful in the management of acute exacerbation of asthma among the options which are provided. Just to give you an overview about um, acute exacerbation of asthma management, this is the overview in the management of acute exacerbation of asthma. Our primary goals are to correct hypoxemia, rapidly correct the airflow obstruction or the bronchoconstriction and also to prevent progression or recurrence of symptoms. Now, how do we correct this? First thing for correction of hypoxemia, you have to start oxygen and for airflow limitation to be reversed, you have to do bronchodilator inhalation which is inhaled beta agonist therapy. As I told you, we do it like every 20 minutes for one hour. That means three times you have to do this inhale 
beta agonist therapy. And if necessary, even after responding, not responding to beta agonist therapy, you have to give one dose of oral or intravenous systemic steroids have to be used. Okay, this is the usual first step in the management of acute exacerbation of asthma. Now, after this also, if the child is not responding, then you have to repeat the nebulization, but this time along with the beta agonist, you also have to add inhaled ipratropium. Okay, right. Usually by this stage, uh, by this time, the child would have responded and the bronchoconstriction of the V's would have been controlled. Even after this also, the asthma is not responding or the acute exacerbation is not responding or the V's is persisting, then we have to go for the other option which include administration of magnesium sulphate, terbutalin and parenteral adrenaline. These would be the treatment options at this stage if the child is not responding to the previous management. That is about the overview of acute exacerbation of asthma. Moving on to the next question. Regarding urinary tract infection in children, which of the following is true? This was also a multiple option type question where you have to choose all the true statements. First option, most common cause is streptococcus pneumoniae. Absolutely wrong statement because we know that the most common cause is E. coli. Most of the age groups, the most common cause is E. coli. So that's a wrong statement. Bowel bladder fun dysfunction increases the risk of recurrence. Absolutely a true statement. What we have seen is in children with constipation, there's an increased risk of recurrent UTI. Second thing, uh, most of the time uh, in the school going children, okay, where they hold the urine for a long period of time, that can be associated with bladder dysfunction and that can also predispose to recurrent UTI. So this is a true statement. Ultrasound KUB should be done in all children with UTA. That's a true statement because ultrasound KUB is like a screening test which will tell you an overview about the structure of the kidney and the urinary tract. So it should be done in all children with UTA. That's a true statement. MCU should be done in children with recurrent UTA. That is also a true statement because MCU primarily is done to detect the anomalies. And what are the anomalies which can be associated with recurrent UTA? These include VUR and posterior urethral valve. They will be associated with recurrent UTA and they, and they can be picked up by MCU test. Okay, So that is why all children with recurrent UTA, you have to go for VUR and posterior urethral valve. Okay? Now these are some of the guidelines and timing of investigations following urinary tract infection. Okay, These are the three main things. Ultrasound KUB is a screening investigation and it can be done at any time. Even during treatment of UTA also it can be done. Next is about MCU. I told you the role is for detection of anomalies and it is usually done 2 to 4 weeks after treatment of UTA. The rationale is very simple. You don't want to do the catheterization to administer the contrast at the time the child is having treatment for UTA. So after completing the treatment, you will do MCU. DMSA scan is done to detect renal scars and that is done few months after treatment, typically 3 to 4 months after treatment. This is because if you do the DMSA scan very very early, okay, the healing lesions of UTA itself can mimic like a renal scar. That is why to overcome this diagnostic uncertainty, we postpone the DMSA scan to 3 to 4 months after treatment of urinary tract infection. These are all the guidelines regarding when to plan investigations following a treatment of urinary tract infection in children. Moving on to the next question, most common gene mutation cystic fibrosis. Numerous questions about cystic fibrosis have been asked in the previous exam. This is one such question which is actually a repeat question from the one of the previous exams. Okay, now this question is asking about what is the mutation in the sense it is concerned with which amino acid as well as at which position of the amino acid chain along with that what is the defective channel. What is the best answer for the question? Yes, it is option A which is phenylalanine at 508 position and coding for the chloride channel. We all know about this. It is usually remembered as delta F508 mutation involving the CFTR gene. That is the most common mutation in cystic fibrosis. What is that? Delta F refers to delta is deletion. Deletion of phenylalanine at the 508 position. That is the most common mutation affecting the CFTR gene and because of this the CFTR becomes 
dysfunctional. CFTR is nothing but a chloride conductance channel that becomes inactive or dysfunctional in case of cystic fibrosis which is supposed to be the most important abnormality in cystic fibrosis and due to this dysfunctional chloride channel all the secretions become thick including the mucus secretion will become thick intestinal secretion will become thick all the secretions will become thick so that is why this condition is referred to as mucoviscidosis mucoviscidosis simply means muco means the mucus Visid means thick. So the secretions like the mucus are becoming thick inside the body which is the basic abnormality in case of cystic fibrosis. So this is pretty straightforward question with option A as the answer. Next question, which of the following cyanotic HD that is heart diseases has increased pulmonary blood flow? Look at the options. In the Epstein's anomaly, there is not increased pulmonary blood flow, there is decreased pulmonary blood flow simply because there is a downward displacement of the tricuspid valve in Epstein's anomaly which will prevent uh, a proper or a normal forward flow into the ventricles. So there will be decreased pulmonary blood flow in Epstein's anomaly and not increased pulmonary blood flow. So that option is out. Tetralogy of fellow, we know very classically it is associated with subpulmonary stenosis associated with decreased pulmonary blood flow. So that option is also not the answer. TGA and TAPVC, you do have increased pulmonary blood flow and that will be the answer. So from the options provided, it is the option C, which is the 3 and 4 condition, namely TGA and TAPVC. They are associated with increased pulmonary blood flow. This is the basic classification of cyanotic congenital heart defects into increased and decreased pulmonary blood flow. Classically, in decreased pulmonary blood flow, we have tetralogy of fallow, Epstein's anomaly and tricuspid atresia. Whereas in increased pulmonary blood flow lesion, we have TGA that is transposition, TAPVC which is anomaly of the pulmonary veins as well as truncus arteriosus. So three classical condition under increased pulmonary blood flow. Okay, That's about this particular question. We will move on to the next one. Again a multiple option type question. Which of the following is true statement regarding hemophilia A? Hemophilia A we know is one of the important examples of a coagulation disorder involving the factor 8. Look at the options. It is an X-linked recessive disease, absolutely true statement. It is in fact an X-linked recessive disease only. So seen more in males, of course it's a true statement because X-linked recessive disorders are common in males only. Associated with factor 8 deficiency, which is also a true statement. Look at the last one, mucosal bleeding is present. See, hemophilia is a clotting factor defect. It is characterized by deep bleeds, very important point. Mucosal bleeds are like superficial bleeds which are not in association with hemophilia A. Okay? In fact, when we talk about the type of bleeds in hemophilia A, the classical deep bleed which occurs in hemophilia A is heme arthrosis. Heme arthrosis. That means bleeding into the joint. And ankle joint is the earliest joint affected in case of um, by heme arthrosis in hemophilia A. The other manifestation of deep bleeds would include muscle hematoma okay and something like iliopsoas bleed which is also a muscle hematoma can be even very dangerous in a child because it can even be associated with shock so the point to be learnt is hemophilia is characterized by deep bleeds like muscle hematomas or heme arthrosis and not superficial bleeds like mucosal bleeds that is a point to be noted so among the options which are provided one two and three are the correct statement and the answer for this particular question Moving on to the next question, a 11 year old boy was brought to OPD with the tremors and poor scholastic performance. His sister also has similar complaints. They are trying to give you a clue that it is an inherited disorder. On examination, hepatomegaly is seen, so something involving the liver also. Eye finding has been shown in the image. This is the eye finding where you can see there is ictrus in the eyes, jaundice. So definitely this child is having liver involvement with hepatomegaly and uterus. And one more thing, tremors and poor scholastic performance may point to a problem in the CNS. So we have a condition which is involving the brain as well as the liver. Look at the option. Glutaric aciduria can be associated with neurological deterioration. But the point to be noted usually doesn't cause liver manifestation. So that option is out. Huntington's chorea, as we all know, is a neurodegenerative disorder condition and can be associated with chorea and other extra pyramidal manifestation but usually will not have a liver involvement. So that is also out. 
Hepatitis A is an acute manifestation of viral hepatitis and usually doesn't involve the uh, CNS in the form of tremors and poor scholastic performance that is not seen with hepatitis A. So that option is also out. So the answer for this question is very clearly Wilson disease, okay, which is a condition which is fitting into it. We all know that Wilson disease is an autosomal recessive disorder. That is why there is a family history in this particular condition also. Number one. Number two, Wilson disease is an important genetic disorder characterized by ATP7B gene defect because of which what happens there is a decreased level of ceruloplasmin associated with increased free copper. That free copper is the one which is causing the problems in Wilson disease when it gets deposited in the liver it causes liver damage like seen in this particular patient. When it is involving the brain, it causes neurological manifestation. Typically, basal ganglia is the area which is affected in neurological manifestations of Wilson disease. Okay, it will also involve the eyes, causing the KF rings, which is the K circulation ring, as well as it can be associated with sunflower cataract also. These are all the typical manifestations of Wilson disease. And what made us think about Wilson disease is the association of liver manifestation and neurological manifestation in this particular question. That is about the questions which were asked in the first session of INICT exam in November 2022. Now let's see the questions which are asked in the next session starting with this question. 11 year old child with acute rheumatic fever and no cardiac pathology, what should be the duration of penicillin prophylaxis? This is one of the repeat questions actually which was asked in a very recent competitive exam uh, where you have to decide the duration of penicillin prophylaxis. We always know this point that acute rheumatic fever requires prophylaxis to prevent a second episode of uh, rheumatic fever because we know that at the time of uh, recurrence of rheumatic fever, cardiac damage will be even more severe. So this type of prophylaxis is called as secondary prophylaxis. So now the duration of prophylaxis will be decided based on whether the child is having a cardiac problem or not. In this question, it is clearly mentioned there is no cardiac pathology. So what should be the duration of prophylaxis? It will be for the next 5 years. That is a point to be noted. So this is the details about the duration of prophylaxis. Uh, I'll first finish the duration and then I'll come to the drug. Suppose there is no carditis. How long should we give the prophylaxis? That is what the question is about. For the next 5 years or till the age of 18 years whichever is longer very important whichever is a longer duration you have to decide but this question was was, uh, was asking only about the total duration so next five years will be the answer suppose if there is carditis you have to give the prophylaxis for the next 10 years or till the age of 25 years again whichever is longer and the third scenario where the patient has an established RHD that is rheumatic heart disease like an aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis like that, then ideally lifelong prophylaxis is recommended. And what is the drug which we are using for prophylaxis? It is benzathine penicillin. Or penicillin G. Okay, which is a parenteral form of penicillin usually given as a intramuscular injection every three to four weeks and the dose of the benzathine penicillin depends on the weight of the child. Suppose the weight is less than 30 kilogram you give the dose as 6 lakh international units and if the weight is more than or equal to 30 kilograms you give it as 12 lakh international units. Okay now as an alternative to this injectable penicillin you can also use oral penicillin V in the dose of 250 mg orally twice a day okay that will be the alternative for injectable penicillin this is about the due the dose and duration of prophylaxis in acute rheumatic fever moving on to the next one true about the tape in the given image it was again a multiple option type question we all know about this tape this is the shakir's tape so the first option is wrong because it's not shelter's tape it is shakir's Okay, so that's a wrong option. Used to assess severe acute malnutrition, definitely a correct statement. In fact, uh, 
in the field visits and all, we use this Shaki step to quickly assess whether the child is having severe malnutrition or not. And you can see in the Shaki step, there are three zones and the red zone is the one which is corresponding to severe malnutrition. And it is also very important that you should know the value which corresponds to severe malnutrition which is less than 11.5 centimeters. Should not forget this. Okay. So definitely it is used in the assessment of severe acute malnutrition. In fact, mid-arm circumference is measured with the help of Shaki's tape and if the value is less than 11.5 centimeters, it is one of the sure signs of severe acute malnutrition in the child. Okay. Reading of 13.5 to 14.5 is considered undernourished. It's a very, very wrong statement. Let us look at the uh, values according to the tape. I already I have told you less than 11.5 centimeters severe malnutrition, 11.5 to 12.5 that is the yellow zone okay is suggestive of malnutrition okay 11.5 to 12.5 and more than 12.5 centimeters as you can see in the green zone meaning normal nutrition. These are the number based interpretation of the Shakir's tape. Useful for the frontline health workers that is also a true statement. Uh, even the health workers like the Anganwadi workers or the ASHA workers, they can carry the tape at the time of field visits and for them their guiding factor will be the color. They will give the report like how many children are in the green zone which means normal nutrition and how many are in malnutrition and how many are having red zone that means the severe malnutrition. So it is definitely used by the frontline healthcare workers that is also a true statement. So options uh, B and D are true statement and you have to choose an option which will have both these answers included. Okay, so that's about this particular question. Next question, steps in the management of a child with status epilepticus. Status epilepticus as we all know is a seizure for long duration of long duration and uh, steps in the management has been asked. You have to know the order in which we are going to treat uh, a child with status epilepticus. Okay, first one will always be airway and breathing. It is nothing but the ABCs, right? Airway, breathing, circulation, which will always be the first step. Second, once you have stabilized the child, second would be to give uh, intravenous benzodiazepine as given in the question IV lorazepam will be the second step. Third one, if the seizure is not controlled, you have to go for phosphenitoin. Intravenous phosphenitoin will be the second line management. And finally, even after phosphenitoin also, the child is not responding. Last, you have to go for infusions of midazolam propofol and thiopentol. This will be the order according to the options given in the question. This is an overview of management of status epilepticus. As I told you, always, always the initial thing is stabilization, which includes A, B, C and D also. What does this D here stands for? D here stands for the neurological disability, where we have to quickly assess what is the neurological disability in the patient. And also at this time, you have to try to establish an IV access because the medications are going to be administered by the intravenous route only. Okay. Then once this patient is stabilized and the IV access is obtained, the first drug is always IV benzodiazepine. Like in the question it was given lorazepam. You can use lorazepam, midazolam, diazepam, all those drugs. Okay. So IV benzodiazepine is an initial management and then if the seizure is not getting controlled, you have to choose a second line drug. Okay. Second line drug can be one of the following which includes phosphenitoin, valproic acid and levetiracetam. Okay, guidelines are very clearly saying you have to choose any one of these three. Okay, very important. It is not that phosphenitoin is always used. Okay, you can also use valproic acid. So, any one of this will be chosen. Okay, so even after second line medication also, the seizure is not getting controlled. Then we have to go to the last one, which is administering of thiopentone, midazolam or phenobarbitone or propofol in anesthetic doses. Okay, that means you are going to give it like a continuous intravenous infusion. Of course, whenever you are using these drugs uh, in anesthetic dose, it is very, very important that the patient should be monitored with a EEG, continuous EEG monitoring is recommended. This is the outline of steps in the management of status epilepticus. One more point to be added here is what is the uh, definition of status epilepticus? Okay, It can be defined under two timelines, something called T1 and T2. 
T1 refers to the time at which the treatment should be initiated which is any seizure lasting for more than 5 minutes you have to start treatment because it is unlikely the seizure can get controlled on its own. So more than 5 minutes of seizure activity mandates treatment with IV anti-epileptics. This is the first definition of status epilepticus. Second thing is called T2. T2 refers to the time at which continuous seizure activity will lead to a long term neurological sequelae. For example, a neuro neuronal injury, okay, like neuronal injury and this time is defined as more than 30 minutes. So please remember the timeline for status epilepticus has been modified into two timelines. One, the time at which you have to start the treatment which is more than 5 minutes. Second is the time at which neurological problems are likely to occur which is more than 30 minutes of seizure activity. These are the uh, updates in the definition of status epilepticus that you should be knowing about. Moving on to the next question. In a child with a long standing history of beta thalassemia and requiring multiple blood transfusion, which is the best method to detect iron overload? It's a very common thing, correct? Beta thalassemia, especially the beta thalassemia major cases or transfusion dependent anemia where we need to transfuse them regularly. But one side effect of this regular transfusions would be the iron accumulation inside the body and definitely you have to detect iron accumulation and if needed you have to treat them with chelating agents also. So that is why this question is asked about which is the best method. If you see the option NTBA that is non-transparent bound iron, liver iron concentration, serum ferritin and MRI assessment of myocardium all can be helping you to pick up the iron status inside the body or iron levels inside the body. But out of these four, the best one and the answer for the question is liver iron concentration. And the liver iron concentration can be done by biopsy or by MRI. And if you have to choose among these two itself, liver MRI will be the best answer to choose. This is a text from Nelson textbook of pediatric which very clearly mentions quantitative liver iron by R2 MRI is the best indicator of total body iron stores and should be obtained in any patient who is undergoing chronic run transfusion therapy. That is an important important point. Not only that, this liver iron concentration also will be a guiding factor for us to, uh, to indicate when to start chelation therapy in a patient with iron overload. Typically chelation is started when the iron levels okay, are more than 5000 microgram per gram dry weight. This is very important. Okay, What is the typical iron level at which the chelation therapy will be started? It is iron concentration of more than 5000 microgram per gram dry weight. That should be remembered. We will move on to the next question. In a child presenting with splenomegaly and hemolytic facies, which of the following investigations needs to be done? This is again a multiple option type question where you have to choose all the applicable options. Okay, Splenomegaly and hemolytic facies tells you about the possibility of a chronic hemolytic anemia, typical condition like thalassemia. Okay, so in this setting, what are all the investigations you are going to do? It's a pretty straightforward question. Look at the option. The first one, HPLC, will it be done for chronic hemolytic anemias like thalassemia? Definitely yes. It is one of the standard ways by which we evaluate hemoglobinopathies like thalassemia and sickle cell anemias. So that is a correct one. PT-APTT is not done because it is usually for assessing the uh, coagulation testing like the clotting factor defects like hemophilia that is where it is done and not for hemolytic anemia so that is out. Bone marrow aspiration usually not done for uh, cases of chronic hemolytic anemias whenever a diagnosis is very very suspicious we may go for it but it is not a usual investigation for uh, chronic hemolytic anemia so that is also a wrong one. Peripheral bed smear of course is one of the standard ways by which we evaluate any child with a suspected hematological problem. So that will be a part of evaluation as well. So HPLC and peripheral blood smears are the investigation out of the options provided which should be done in a child with a hemolytic facies and uh, splenomegaly possibility of thalassemia in this question. Moving on to the next question. Hormone that does not play a role in the growth of the fetus. Growth hormone, insulin, thyroid and glucocorticoid. Okay, The answer is straightforward one. It is growth hormone. Please remember, even though we say growth hormone, it does not influence the fetal growth. Growth hormone has got a role only after birth of the baby. So 
in the fetus or the intrauterine life growth hormone has no role okay when we talk about the fetal growth and the hormone the important important hormones are first insulin number 2 is thyroid it is also remembered to be remembered that glucocorticoids glucocorticoids also have got a role primary towards the later part of gestation in the intrauterine life now look at this wordings from opiga textbook very clearly mentioned growth hormone though present in high levels in fetus is not known to influence the fetal growth so it's a straight forward answer that growth hormone has no role in the fetus growth okay so moving on to the next question in a pediatric patient with a b cell leukemia which is acute lymphoblastic leukemia poor prognostic factors include this is again a multiple option type question where you have to choose all the poor prognostic factor from the options provided hyperploidy is actually a good prognostic factor and will not be the answer okay age less than 1 year definitely is a poor prognostic factor t922 that is translocation 922 is a poor prognostic factor translocation 411 is also a poor prognostic factor it has to be remembered at this time that translocation 1221 is a good prognostic factor okay is a good prognostic factor so out of the option provided the second third and fourth are all poor prognostic factor and should be chosen for this particular question now this is a overview of the prognostic indicators in a child with acute lymphoblastic leukemia one is called as a low risk or the standard risk which is a actually a good prognostic factor and high risk cases which are poor prognostic indicators age less than 1 year or more than 10 year is high risk or poor prognosis whereas 2 to 10 years is a standard risk or a low risk with a good prognosis gender females have a good prognosis males have a poor prognosis organomegaly mediastinal involvement or cns involvement if it is present obviously it's a poor prognostic factor and absent it's a good prognostic factor subtype okay pre b cell is a low risk or a standard risk whereas high risk is a mature b cell now t cell type is also there t cell type is considered as a intermediate risk okay so we cannot categorize it completely as high risk or completely as low risk it is something which is in between okay ploidy as i told you hyperploidy is a good prognostic factor hypoploidy is a poor prognostic factor this genetics that means the translocation are always always a very important question for your exam so many times in the past it has been asked as i told you translocation 1221 is a good prognostic factor also trisomies 4 and 10 are good prognostic all the other translocation namely translocation 922 814 and 411 are all coming under high risk or poor prognostic indicators then early treatment response okay if it is a good response it's a good prognosis if it is a poor response it's a poor prognosis in fact the early treatment response is considered as one of the most important prognostic factors itself so it is something like an important point to be noted okay so that's about this particular question moving on to the next question an 18 month old child is presenting with choking choking is an indicator of foreign body obstruction examination reveals decreased air entry in the left lung so probably it's a foreign body obstruction involving the uh, bronchus that is why there is a decreased air entry in the left lung so most likely according to the information which is provided it should be a foreign body obstruction in the left bronchus okay that is why the air entry on the left side is decreased what are all the management okay here again you have to choose uh, whatever is applicable chest x ray is usually done in cases of suspected foreign body obstruction and that too in the bronchus because it will give you an idea about uh, what type of obstruction the foreign body has caused for example if it is a complete obstruction if it is a complete obstruction by the foreign body what will happen there will be collapse of the affected lung fields okay that could be one indicator suppose it is only a partial block caused by the foreign body it would cause hyperinflation effect it would cause hyperinflation of the lung fields so chest x ray will give you an indicator about what is the type of block caused by the foreign body and definitely should be done in this case so that is a true statement ct chest we don't do usually for this foreign body obstruction 
bronchoscopy is definitely indicated. In fact, the standard way by which a um, foreign body in the bronchus is removed is with the help of bronchoscopy. Please remember, it is a rigid bronchoscopy which has to be used for a removal of the foreign body in the bronchus. Okay. ICD insertion is not indicated for foreign body. That will be for conditions like pneumothorax and empyema and not for a foreign body obstruction. So, chest x-ray and rigid bronchoscopy are indicated in the management of this particular child. So, an option containing both these two, uh, um, I mean both these two uh, investigations should be chosen. Okay. So, that is about this particular um, INACT discussion, recall questions in pediatrics. I hope it was uh, helpful for you and uh, the learning point from this questions is that you should thoroughly go through all the recent year questions because many of the topics as I am saying again were repeated. It is the topics which are repeated and not the questions as such. Okay, So, thoroughly study about all the recent topics and along with the notes which has been provided in the uh, videos, okay, it should be sufficient for you to solve all the questions in the future exams. All the best for your exams and thank you.